Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this uh, policy panel on uh, competition issues around big tech in finance. The opening session of the conference and the uh, first session have uh, set the bar very high uh, in terms of the uh, depth and quality of the discussion and very much uh, expect uh, our discussion to be uh, to, to, to meet this standard. Uh, but it's make it, it's being made much, much easier because the topic is a so obviously a, an important one, uh, competition issues around big tech in finance. Um, it's very clear already from the discussions today that competition is a, is a red thread going uh, through the whole discussion on, our, uh, on our big techs uh, in finance. Uh, we've heard about uh, market power already, we've heard about uh, We've even seen the Harberger Triangle uh, evidencing the market power. Uh, we've uh, heard about uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, complementarities created by uh, access to, to data um, uh, uh, and the, the kind of free positive feedback loops created by uh, new services and access to data. Uh, and at the end, the question, of course, is what, is there anything we should do about it? Is it good or bad uh, for competition? And uh, what should uh, competition authorities and other uh, authorities do about it? Um, so for that, we have a, uh, an outstanding uh, lineup of uh, speakers. Um, so we'll, um, we'll start with uh, Elzi Ado Awadzi, Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Ghana. Uh, we'll then move on to uh, Douglas Arner, a professor in law at the University of Hong Kong, then to uh, Catherine Batchelor, uh, who's the director of the Digital Market Unit at the uh, Competition and Market Authority in London, uh, and uh, Christina Kafara, who's a senior consultant with uh, Charles River, and uh, finally, uh, Tobias Drian, who's a financial counselor uh, and director uh, of the uh, uh, Monetary and Capital Market Department at the IMF. So we have a depth of uh, knowledge about both our analytics, uh, policy issues, and the real world, which is exactly what we need to answer this difficult question. So um, without due delay, uh, let me uh, give the floor to, to Elsie, uh, and uh, particularly um, we, uh, the question I would like to ask you, Elsie, is about the, uh, your experience in Ghana um, with uh, payments and mobile money, and uh, how much have you been able to, uh, to tame uh, payment monopolies in Ghana, and, uh, and what lessons can you draw for the, for the other countries? So, uh, Elsie, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Benoit, and uh, hello to all my co-panelists. Um, so, Ghana has had um, experience with mobile money going back maybe 12 years ago. Uh, this was in the mid um, after the mid 2000s. Um, I must say that it started a bit slowly. This was on the back of East Africa having pioneered it. And uh, we have leapfrogged over the years in, in quite remarkable ways. Um, as we speak, there are about 19 million active mobile money users um, for a population of 30 million. And then you see the growth, the, the rapid growth in this area, for example, uh, we're told that Africa, uh, Ghana is the fastest growing mobile money um, market in, in Africa. Um, also that um, around the world, Ghana is the country that has a third largest mobile money payment rate um, next to Kenya and, and China. And then uh, reports say that 82% of our GDP is held in mobile money wallets. So you see the share significance of the market. And more importantly, it provided more convenience in payments. Um, it helped uh, informal sector businesses become a little bit more formalized because now um, they're, they're, they're able to receive payments um, and therefore they're able to sell more uh, of the services and, uh, and their products. Um, and then also we're seeing that it has really accelerated financial inclusion. Uh, because now um, every Ghanaian in every corner of the country that has an access uh, access to a mobile phone is able to operate uh, a savings account, um, obtain loans uh, on the back of mobile money, uh, receive remittances from abroad, um, and and really do a whole lot more, including um, you know investing in pensions, products, insurance policies, uh, and the like. 
So it's really been a phenomenal success case. It keeps growing. Uh, and there are many other innovations that are, um, are happening on the back of this. Um, in terms of lessons, I would focus on three main ones. Uh, the first one is that infrastructure is important and the type of infrastructure and the, the governance around, around that is something that countries need to uh, think clearly about. So in addition to the mobile money operators, um, really the telcos that had to make vast investments in infrastructure, the central bank also decided in the mid 2000s to invest in the national switching platform that allowed all the telcos to connect to it. Um, and therefore, um, regardless of which uh, telco network you used, you were going to be able to switch money around uh, because of the investments in infrastructure we had made. And we did this through uh, a wholly owned subsidiary that we set up. Um, so infrastructure is key. And over the years, this infrastructure has been has evolved uh, to a point where we have a fully interoperable switching system. So regardless of which telco network you're on, regardless of which bank or which other credit institution uh, you have you have an account with, you're able to move money across. And that's been really phenomenal. That has also helped the smaller fintechs to be able to innovate right in on the back of this infrastructure. The second key lesson is the, is the policy and regulatory regime. And, and we have worked on this over the years, over the last 12 years. We started largely with a, an activity-based regulatory approach. So um, banks and other financial institutions were allowed to partner with mobile money um, or telcos to be able to deliver mobile money. The important thing for us was that uh, these transactions were backed by cash that were held in trust accounts with banks so we could follow the money. Now, it, it was largely activity regulated because what we cared about a consumer protection rules, we cared about AML CFT type regulation, we cared about, about product uh, you know, regulation, making sure that these products were well, uh, well designed and, and acceptable to the market and all of that. Over the years, we have transitioned um, also into an entity-based um, approach in terms of regulation. So in 2015, we issued regulations that required the telcos to ring fence their mobile money operations into fully owned subsidiaries, right? So that we could have direct regulatory and supervisory oversight over those entities. Because tel telcos come under a different regulator. And we wanted to make sure that all their mobile money uh, operations were ring fenced into, into subsidiaries. So we have since then um, obtained oversight, regulatory oversight over these entities, and we, we set out rules in terms of capital, in terms of operational resilience uh, and governance, uh, more recently cybersecurity rules and all of that. It gives us a lot more um, uh, space to be able to regulate them. So that's what we've done. Um, we have opened up the space so that more, more and more entrants, um, more mostly on the fintech side, uh, are coming in as payment service providers and partnering with tech, with these um, dedicated mobile money operators and banks and developing a full range of activities of services and products that, that help to advance our financial inclusion objective. The third and last um, lesson I want to I want to highlight is the um, is the consumer protection aspects of this, and we have also taken that um, quite seriously, particularly the pricing, because what we found was that there was a period of time where um, consumers were were not as excited about this as we had we, we wanted them to, and much of it had to do with the uh, opacity in pricing and all of the hidden costs that that they, they had to confront. And so we've been very, um, you know, very um, strict with, with the pricing regime and promoting more transparency in pricing and, 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 and having conversations with, with these operators to say, you know, how, how are you pricing? What are the components of your pricing? Can you make these a, a little bit more transparent to the market? And we believe that all in all, these have, have contributed to the growth of the, of, the, of, of the phenomenon of mobile money banking in Ghana. And, and I think that, you know, the, the prospects are huge. Now, dovetailing into QR codes on the back of, of mobile money, we have developed a universal QR code 
um, which I believe is helping really to also tame, uh, you know, the dominance of the big telcos uh, that have been in the mobile money space. Because now with the, the what we call the Ghana QR code, which is again, um, it's promoted by uh, a wholly owned subsidiary, the GIPS, which I mentioned, uh, that owns a national switch and the interoperable framework. Uh, the QR code is rolled out across all, all telco networks, all financial institutions. So it makes it easy for banks to go to any merchant to say, um, I can offer you the service and I can acquire you, uh, you know, the, the startup costs are very low. So most merchants can afford this. It's actually next to nothing because it's also done by the central bank subsidiary. Um, and then the, it doesn't matter who's paying um, once they're able to scan the QR code or are able to provide the USSD code, they're able to make payments regardless of where their money sits, you know, whether it's in a bank, whether it's in a savings and loans account, whether it sits on a mobile money wallet with any of the telcos. So this has really helped and it's a real game changer in terms of how the market is having to function. Uh, and it's much lower pricing for the merchants. And so we're finding more and more merchants choosing that over mobile money. And so that's providing some competition in, in that space. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, LZ. So infrastructures, uh, regulation, consumer protection, uh, that helps a lot to uh, put, uh, put the right structure on our discussion. And then I'm sure we'll come back to it in, uh, in, uh, in the discussion. So let's move from uh, Ghana to, uh, to China. Uh, and turn to, uh, to Doug Arner. So Doug, you've been a, a keen observer uh, of, the, uh, of the FinTech and the big tech scene in, uh, in China. And to use the words uh, used by Agustin Carstens in his open, opening speech, uh, the uh, big tech activities in China have moved very fast from too small to care to too big to ignore, uh, and maybe uh, too, uh, too big to fail. So um, how, do, how do authorities, how can authorities react in real time and, uh, and uh, how should they react? So Doug, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, and, uh, and great to have Augustine sort of uh, bring up that remark, which um, I think we've been amazed how well has uh, described uh, much of what we've seen. I think China, as you suggest, is an incredibly interesting case because China has probably experienced the most rapid and comprehensive digital financial transformation uh, of any country uh, in history. And I think it provides a very interesting uh, case study in particular, because if you look at China's uh, evolution of digital finance over the past decade, you can think of it initially as um, an experiment in some ways to try to address existing constraints in the traditional financial system. Existing constraints we're familiar with from every economy. And the idea was very much that the traditional financial system was not very effective at directing financial resources in particular to small and medium sized enterprises uh, and the non-state sector. And so there was essentially an experiment in allowing digital finance to evolve as an effort to try to uh, address uh, this grand challenge. And on one side, you can see the evolution of thousands of P2P platforms, which largely failed as a way to address this uh, problem. And the other, you can see the evolution uh, eventually of large digital platforms. In other words, the platformization uh, of finance. And if we think about the evolutionary trajectory uh, of Alibaba, of Ant, or of Tencent, uh, essentially both began with payments uh, and seeking to integrate payments with other forms of, of activities, e-commerce in the case of Alibaba, gaming and social media in the context uh, of Tencent, and reflecting the idea of network effects combined with economies of scope and scale. So we can see network effects in tech and data, economies of scope and scale in finance. The combination of the two, we eventually see the emergence of a small number uh, of very dominant 
players, particularly in the context of payments. Uh, Ant and Tencent eventually with a billion payments customers each. Uh, and using the data pools built from those payments platforms as well as a range of other activities to essentially do something which we had always wanted to achieve, which was real-time automated cash flow and reputational analysis for SME lending. And generally agreed, success in the context of that platform-based model in increasing financial resources available to SMEs. And then taking that data-based model and expanding into investment, money market mutual funds is the paradigmatic example with Ant. Uh, and of course, as I just mentioned, lending. But I think the question, and often if we look at uh, Chinese strategies, it's a, an objective of trying to balance stability objectives, both financial stability as well as social stability, with growth, development, uh, and innovation. Uh, objectives. And what I think we can see is that it was clear by 2019 that Ant in particular was emerging as uh, a new systemically important financial institution, one of the major players. And so efforts to, one, build alternative approaches and two, uh, build a regulatory framework. And I think the idea here is if we think of tech and finance. We can think of this current era, which we categorize as FinTech 4.0, as a period of platformization. And what platformization allows is the very rapid movement from new entrant to large scale to potentially uh, too big to fail, and the necessity of balancing both the benefits that we can get out of data aggregation with the concentration and dominance risks. And I think in the context of China, the eventual conclusion was both concern about the stability risks as well as impact that concentration and dominance were having from the standpoint of restricting innovation and development. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, may I ask you a follow-up question, uh, just, just to follow up on what you just said? Uh, data can be addressed under the angle of competition, uh, namely uh, aggregation and concentration, as you just did. But how much, is, how much does privacy weigh into the considerations in, uh, of the authorities in China? Yes, I think this is a very important point. And, you know, if we think about finance, finance, of course, today, is one of the world's most globalized, one of the world's most regulated, and one of the world's most digitized industries. And so that means when we're dealing with finance, essentially increasingly we're dealing with data. And what that means is that yes, as you highlight, we're seeing, uh, if anything, an increasing policy consensus amongst countries that data use is a core strategy for competition and development, uh, competitiveness and development uh, going forward. And if we look at different economies, we're seeing different strategies as well as different um, cultural or, or policy approaches, not only to the question of how you achieve aggregation, I'm very happy to talk about this, versus balancing who actually owns and controls data, and that's that idea uh, of privacy protection or individual rights uh, to own or control data. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. So now let's ask a, a competition authority. Uh, so uh, Catherine, uh, the um, Digital Markets Unit has just closed a, a consultation on a, uh, on a new uh, pro-competition regime for digital markets. Uh, can you can you tell us about the proposals, about the reactions, and uh, and what would the implementation look like in practice? Uh, yes, of course, and thank you for inviting me to speak today and participate in this panel. Um, so it, it's not actually the DMU that's closed the consultation; it's our government, and they've just consulted on proposals for a new competition regime for digital markets. And this consultation follows a range of reports that have been published across the world, but in the UK most notably the Furman Review, which have all concluded 
that um, a new approach is needed to dealing with the competition problems posed by the most powerful platforms. So these reports have um, noted the harms that can arise as a result of um, concentration and market power held by these big platforms. So the risks directly to consumers in terms of um, what we always say higher prices, but obviously we've talked about privacy. So uh, loss of data and lower quality privacy standards, but also the sort of indirect harms that can result um, through the sort of businesses that rely on the platforms to to trade or to advertise, but also the competing businesses and the harms that the big tech companies can pose to competitors and uh, through that, the sort of long-term risk to innovation, which uh, Douglas alluded to. And so given these harms, these reports have concluded that a new approach is needed and that relying on ex-post antitrust enforcement to deal with the sort of anti-competitive conduct on a case-by-case -case basis, you know, always sort of looking narrowly and acting after the fact um, is not sufficient. And that rather an, a sort of ex-ante approach is needed to set the rules of the game in advance um, and to sort of shape these markets in a way that delivers more vibrant competition and innovation in the interests of consumers. And that's what these proposals are aiming at. And there are sort of three key parts to the regime. The regime would apply to firms with strategic market status, and that um, is intended to mean firms with substantial entrenched market power and where the effects of that market power are particularly widespread or significant. So I should say the regime is aimed at a very narrow group of the most powerful digital firms. And for firms that meet that test, there are three key pillars. The first is this code of conduct, which is an enforceable code and is intended to set out requirements on these firms in advance. Um, and this is very much to, um, to address the concerns around um, these firms taking advantage of their powerful position, either through exploiting consumers or businesses or acting to exclude or quash uh, their competitors. So the first pillar is the code of conduct. The second are what we term pro-competitive interventions, and these are interventions like data access or consumer choice remedies, um, in the most extreme cases, separation remedies, which could be implemented in order to address the root causes of the firm's market power or the reason why they have such a powerful position. And these are very much intended to promote competition, to create greater contestability and opportunities in the market for greater competition to emerge. And the third pillar of the regime um, is a bespoke merger regime for those firms that have this strategic market status. And that's intended to enable the CMA to greater scrutinise transactions that these firms enter into. Um, in terms of implementation, so that is a consultation, and as you say, it's just closed, um, and our government has committed to moving forward with the legislation that's necessary to enact these proposals um, as soon as parliamentary time allows, and I can't tell you any more than that. But in the meantime, whilst we're waiting for that legislation, the DEMU has been established within the CMA in shadow form. Uh, and we are working on preparing for this new regime. So thinking about the problems that it might need to address and getting ready to address them, uh, but also continuing to use the CMA's existing powers to the full extent. And you'll have seen there's a range of markets and antitrust and consumer cases that we're taking on across digital markets. So a brief summary from me. Thank you very much. Uh... Catherine, I'm sure we'll have the uh, opportunity to come back to the, uh, to, the, to the consultation, but I would like to move to, uh, to Christina Kafara. Uh, as uh, a consultant uh, and as a, as a lawyer and also as an economist, uh, you, uh, you have a 360 degree view of, uh, of different approaches to, uh, to, uh, to big techs in, in finance and to different uh, regulatory proposals. Um, and, uh, and you've been critical of uh, 
the, the new EU uh, regulatory proposals, I quote, uh, effective merger moratoria, breakups of uh, past anti-competitive mergers, wall-to-wall -wall interoperability, data protection, and new thinking around shared digital infrastructures to create scale and favor new opportunities. And that's all needed in Europe. So, so can you elaborate a little bit on, on this and uh, compare the European approach with other approaches and, and what are, wh why would these steps that you've been highlighting uh, be uh, needed? Thank you so much, Benoit, and, and thank you for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me start with what I consider uh, an important uh, uh, starting point for anyone in the public, in the private sector who isn't uh, speaking from the private, uh, the public sector. I, I, I'm a consultant, as you say, so in my career, I have worked consistently with Google, worked against Facebook, I've done some work for Amazon, I've done some work for Apple, uh, for uh, News Corp, for Uber, and for others. Um, let me start with tracing <laughs> the excerpt from my recent paper uh, a little bit into context. I come at this as someone who spends a lot of time thinking and working on digital uh, regulation and antitrust uh, cases in the digital space. And it's fascinating for me to see this event and indeed the number of papers that are emerging in this world, in the world of financial conduct, in the world of financial stability, uh, essentially taking notice of the great amount of activity that is taking place in uh, the, the, the regulatory and antitrust space around the power of digital power. So it is a fascinating development to see that uh, the financial world is, is taking this on board. And what we're faced with now, broadly, at the European level, but not only, it's true in the United States and also elsewhere, is a huge amount of experimentation that is going on uh, on how we should go about regulating big tech across the world. Why are we witnessing this big pivot towards regulation? Because quite plainly, antitrust has failed in regulating these uh, companies. I mean, uh, Catherine put it very mildly. She said there are difficulties. The reality is antitrust has failed. We are facing a market power crisis and a privacy crisis, and the two compound each other. And the reality is that antitrust has not been capable of preventing the erection and the entrenchment of this market power for all of the kind of reasons that Jason Furman went on this, uh, went on this morning. They have a particular set of characteristics that mean that uh, it is uh, quite difficult to stop uh, that progression in so many ways. They have inherent advantages, which have got to do with data and uh, network effects. But fundamentally, we have failed to do it. In the US, there's been a permafrost in terms of antitrust for 20 years after the Microsoft case. In Europe, notwithstanding the great good intention of the European antitrust regulators, we've had a set of cases against Google in Europe that failed miserably. Google has continued its progression. The only country that has enforced against Facebook has been Germany and no one else. Things are beginning to bubble up, but not much. So against this sense that antitrust is effectively a total failure in this space, notwithstanding the good intention, we have collectively felt that we need to complement this idea of antitrust, which is exposed, which is narrow, looks at case by case, with exams at regulation. And the ambition is to create a regime which is clear, which is self-enforcing, which is actually, uh, uh, in, in some sense, uh, sufficient for companies to, to look at and just, uh, to some extent, self regulate My skepticism of the uh, European proposals, and let me say, I believe in the need for uh, regulation, and I'm a great fan of the UK model, which is a bespoke one, and uh, the intention is to really look at individual platforms one by one and effectively uh, focus on, on, on them and their particular problem. The problem with the one that the European Commission has come up with is that it is effectively a version of the antitrust cases only in the form of a synopsis. So you take all of the cases that have been done against Google, against Amazon, and not completed incidentally, Apple and so on. You kind of condense that into synopsis, and then you have Article 5.B. You shall not start preference. What does that really mean in practice, and how does that actually get implemented? Well, my prediction is that 
this is going to have some effect, increasing the worst uh, effects, the worst uh, 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 manifestations of abuses of dominance on a particular platform. But to use the language that Jason Fulman was using this morning, this is not going to implement competition for the market. These companies, the five, the four, will remain hyper dominant in their spaces for the next 20 years, unless something more, more even than this regulation takes place. And this is the context in which I think we need to look at mergers very seriously. Market power has been entrenched by incredibly poor enforcement in merge control. Uh, we need to look at it. We're going one to one interoperability. There's huge resistance to that, but it is absolutely important to allow network effects to be overcome. And we also need to look at ultimately at this idea of shared digital infrastructure, which is an idea that a lot of people are thinking about. Because what we need to create is that uh, there are missing layers in the internet that have been filled by proprietary wall gardens. We had Internet One, and now we have Web Two, which is effectively proprietary. And where all the economies of scale and scope are effectively realized at the firm level. So we need to create a different way of thinking about Internet 3, Web 3, giving the opportunity to create digital identities that are shared, protocols that are non-proprietary, so that eventually we create the opportunity for more digital diversity. That's the sense in which I think that the current rules don't go far enough. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. This was very clear, clear words and also strong words. You um, talked about the market power crisis and a and the privacy crisis. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, if if I may ask you a follow up question before before moving on, I mean, how much does the provision of financial services add to this market power crisis and this privacy crisis? Because presumably they were there before uh, these companies uh, stepped into finance. So how is that going to change the, the landscape? Well, I mean, financial is, financial companies, banks, uh, I think we heard a good presentation from Portway that describes the need for injecting competition also in this uh, uh, more, uh, more traditional, conventional uh, markets. So the good size of that uh, entry into these markets is that incumbency of that traditional kind can be challenged. But I mean, we are all concerned with the data aspect of things and the advantage that that creates. When I talk about a privacy crisis, this is the fundamental issue of our time. And the, the failure of antitrust that I mentioned about a moment ago is also a failure of integrating the perspective of us. We have pursued antitrust and privacy as two sides. And the antitrust people have been saying, what are you doing with me? I'm looking away. I'm doing market power. I don't care for privacy. You've got the, the data protection people over there. You've got the GDPR. In reality, the data protection people have got plastic knives to fight the big giant because they don't have the means, GDPR is not enforced, nothing is happening. So this is a big problem. So financial, uh, uh, financial operators are coming into this, you know, and the, and the big question is how will that will intersect and interact? But the big discussion now at the level of market power and privacy data protection is huge and we need to solve that as well as integrate the perspective of financial markets and financial institutions. Thank you, uh, Christina. So last but not least, we move to Tobias Adrian uh, from the IMF. Uh, so Tobias, the IMF has been very active thinking about fintech and big tech uh, and data. Uh, even this morning, uh, there was a, a staff discussion note uh, uh, out on uh, a global approach to data uh, in the digital age. So can you can you share with us some of your perspective uh, uh, from the from the funds perspective? Yeah, thanks so much, uh, um, Benoit. Uh, thanks for having me in this fascinating panel. Uh, the discussion here was already uh, very rich, and um, uh, let me let me start off right where Christina left off. Um, so in 2020, the Bank of England did a survey uh, which estimated that over 70% of banks and over 80% over of insurers use just two cloud service providers. Um, and when you look globally, uh, about 50% uh, of cloud services come from just two providers, right? So, uh, you know, the points that uh, Christina and Catherine uh, and Douglas made about concentration 
and the potential for market power is very, very clear. And um, you know, financial services are using uh, those services extremely actively. And of course, uh, as, a, as a financial regulator, uh, that immediately rings a bell in terms of systemically important activities, right? When uh, your financial system uh, depends on infrastructure-like um, uh, uh, services, uh, you know, that have this uh, massive concentration, uh, that is certainly a uh, worrisome. I think that Douglas already said, uh, you know, the problem, right? I mean, uh, what what would happen if the cloud services uh, were to fail, if one of those uh, uh, companies were to fail, devastating impacts uh, on financial services. And that in and of itself is a, is a, huge, uh, is a huge challenge. So uh, secondly, uh, now, potential benefits uh, as well from uh, big tech entering into and that uh, so more it, financial inclusion uh, it seems that we are we're having a small uh, technical issue uh, with Tobias so we'll try to reconnect him so the cross up the very much okay so we are we do have an issue with our with Tobias that's the beauty of her online conferences so while we are trying to fix it um, can you hear me now? let me uh let me come back to the uh, to the other speakers, um, and um, let let me ask the speakers if they if is there anything you would like to to react to in what you've heard so far before I uh, open the floor, um, and of course we'll give a chance to Tobias to uh, to come back, <laughs> and uh, and and uh, and uh, and complete his his remarks. But is there, is there anything you would like to uh, to add or to react to? No, okay. Um, I, I could, um, yeah. um, yes, please. Benoit, yes, please. Um, I just I, wanted to, yes, I just wanted to sort of uh, add my voice to the uh, the concentration risk matter. And um, I think for many of us, what happened on Monday with the Facebook um, network crashing for perhaps half the business day, about six hours or so, uh, was actually quite revealing. I mean, not that we had we, we, we hadn't thought of that possibility, but seeing that happening and the 3.5 billion people around the world that have become so used to uh, these platforms, right? And the, the share concentration of risks that that entails. Um, for a regulator like us in Ghana, we, we allow the banks to use what they call social media banking uh, you know, tools, and therefore a lot of the new uh, sort of clients are sort of are onboarded through Facebook or WhatsApp and, and Instagram and all of that, basically to create more access to finance. And that was quite uh, frightening. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually about time that we did something about those risks, quite apart from the cloud-based banking uh, issues that Tobias was alluding to. Uh, the, the, the fact that um, we become so dependent on these and the shell operational risks that, that um, we're all having to deal with. And then thinking of the fact that in some markets, these big techs are also playing directly um, as financial service providers, you know, in a very subtle way, but really uh, they're competing with banks and other licensed financial institutions uh, and providing services that are not just tech related, but also are financial services uh, without much of the regulation that financial institutions must deal with. Um, and, and there's this big black hole in the global uh, architecture uh, and regulatory framework where no one is really dealing with this issue. So countries that are dealing with this are dealing with this as competition or as a data 
uh, protection or you know our uh, ancillary approaches, but no one is really looking at the financial uh, stability risks and and the fact that this has become a globally uh, significantly uh, important issue. But then they're, they're free in terms of all of the rules that relate to other players who are seen to pose such uh, risks to the global financial system. So I think it's a wake up call and it's important that uh, this conversation is happening at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elsie. I mean, that's a very important point you're making uh, that, that speaks to the role of big techs, uh, not only as providers of uh, financial services, but also as um, critical service providers uh, in, the, uh, in the financial field. Um, I've been a standard setter for financial market infrastructures and the elephant in the room was the role of big tech companies in providing uh, cloud services, for instance, which are critical and which, creates, which can create nodes of uh, contagion outside of the financial system, but nevertheless important. So, so may, I, may, I, may I kind of uh, 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 turn to, uh, to Catherine and, and ask, I mean, how do, you, how do you deal with that in your framework? How do you deal with the role of, say, the, the, the Facebooks of this world as a providers of services that help, that are part of the infrastructure that the financial system needs to work. So it's, um, as you said, really, really topical and we've spent a fair amount of time talking and thinking about this this week for obvious reasons. I think there's two points I would make. Firstly, that if you want greater resilience, then you won't necessarily use competition as the tool uh, to to address that, but nevertheless, there are important interactions. So the regime that we're building, its primary function will never be to support greater resilience. That's not what's been outlined for it. But nevertheless, there are important interactions between the competition regime and questions around resilience. Um, and I think, you know, I saw the comment the Stargo made around, you know, does competition one of the lessons of this outage being, well, you need greater competition. I think I've landed on sort of two points. The first being that competition will not necessarily deliver you less outages. If you think about the sort of traditional relationship between competition um, and these other, and resilience as a policy directive, uh, policy objective, quite often, you know, the impact of really vibrant competition can be a race to the bottom and actually more of these kind of outages but actually what you can what is really important that competition gives you is it can lessen the impact of these outages if you have greater choice uh, and consumers have greater alternatives then actually if something does go down then the impact of that is lessened so i think it's important to um, understand that kind of dynamic um, co competition won't necessarily put the incentives in place to drive the right incentives in terms of resilience and outages, but it can be really important in managing the impact of those outages. Um, in terms of the framework we're putting forward, as I say, resilience will never be the sort of primary motivator of the DMU. But as I say, there are really important interactions as there are with privacy, as you've recognised, as there are with financial services. And one of the sort of key questions that our government is grappling with is the extent to which we as a regulator should be predominantly focused on competition or the extent to which we should have discretion to be able to factor into our decision making the impact our decisions might have on these wider policy objectives like resilience and obviously we're very in favour of this idea of when we're thinking about the impact an intervention to promote competition is likely to have being able to consider the sort of holistic impact of that intervention not only on consumers but also on privacy and on resilience and on these wider objectives. Um, but there are sort of legitimate questions around the extent to which we should be able to take those kind of factors into account in our decision making. So, um, as I say, it's a bit of an open question and it's something that our government are grappling with, um, but it's something we're thinking hard about. It's not easy. But why can I jump in and make a brief comment to this? Uh Yes, if I may. and please be brief because then we are we need to give a chance to Tobias to uh, to uh, to, yes. uh, to say. Yes, that. I'll be less than a minute. So I think, of course, the outage is a very graphic example of what I was talking about. No one in their right mind is deluded. The competition 
intervention can, be, can bring about more resilience, okay? This is delusional, it shouldn't even be talked about. The question is whether regulation of some sort can bring about intervention. To the extent that regulation is an such competition policy, forget it, it's not gonna do it. It's gonna just think at the margin with, okay, don't be basically to the sellers on Amazon. Okay, that's what it's gonna do. Don't be basically to the developers on Amazon. That's what it's gonna do. But it's not gonna bring about resilience. For that, we need more. We need people who think about a new generation internet, we need people who think about the missing layers of the internet, communication, payments, data sharing. All of that that is now pro crime is a world garden and needs to be taken in a way that is shared, common, public. Is that short enough? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and there, well, I guess I guess it's part of the traditional dilemmas that uh, regulators have to face that they're they're asked by society to meet different objectives. And uh, uh, in our conversation, we uh, we had uh, we had competition and uh, and financial stability already, and that already creates trade-offs. And now we have privacy, and now we've been adding uh, resilience as an additional objective. So obviously, uh, there are choices to be made. Uh, but let let me give the floor back to Tobias, who could uh, uh, join us back so that you can. Uh, uh, just share what, what, what you had to say. So, I guess we don't have the image, but we should be able to have a sound connection. Oh. Mm. No? Okay. So, I guess we were right to bring resilience into the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So I, I'm not sure what happened. I'm using a call in here. We can hear you, Tobias. Ah, so you're you're able to hear me now. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I was going to make a point about bundling and unbundling. So part of what we are seeing in the fintech domain is that uh, startups are entering financial services, and they're very specialized, very low cost, and that increases competition. So that's a good thing. But of course, on the other hand, big techs are buying up a lot of these startups and they're bundling them uh, back together uh, in, in a kind of, you know, in something that could become a walled uh, garden ecosystem. And um, so uh, in some sense, they are, they are going against the unbundling, against the increase in competition through new entrants. Um, and uh, of course, you know, that can bring synergies uh, in terms of financial inclusion, lower costs. Uh, through the usage of artificial intelligence, cross subsidization and economies of scale. But on the other hand, it can also create market power. And uh, so this is where I think uh, earlier speakers already alluded to uh, the need uh, to take another look at uh, regulations. And it's really uh, a kind of coalition of regulators that have to look at this, right? It's financial regulators that have to come together with competition regulators and then uh, 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 data is the third, right? So there's a financial stability aspect, there's a competition aspect, and there's a data aspect. And having a, a, an approach that is capturing all of these three aspects is, is very much first order. Let me stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Tobias. Uh, and I, I'm glad that you're bringing this question, which I wanted to ask the, the group here. It, I actually asked it to uh, Jason Furman uh, uh, in, in the first session, and the answer was, why don't you raise it in your panel, which I'm doing now. Uh, and that's about uh, cooperation uh, between uh, different authorities. I mean, what's the scope for cooperation between competition authorities, uh, financial regulators, data protection agencies? Uh, is it working? Is it not working? And uh, what can we do about that? So if any of you uh, wants to... Uh, I can obviously offer a, yes, a perspective. Please. Sorry, Douglas, did you want to go first? No, please be my guest, Catherine. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, given it's about cooperation, I should probably uh, say a bit about what we're doing in the UK, given I'm at the competition regulator. We have this thing in the UK called the Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum, which is us, the CMA, the ICO, which is our data protection authority, the Financial Conduct Authority, which is our financial services um, regulator, and Ofcom, which is our communications regulator. Um, and we work very closely together on matters of mutual interest in relation to digital markets. Um, and, you know, it, it's certainly been a journey. Um, it was established last year, but we've always worked together in some 
um, guide and we published a work plan in March on the areas that we're working together and it encompasses a whole range of different areas so it includes what we call strategic projects so things like algorithms um, and big tech use of algorithms which is something we are all grappling with we're all trying to get to grips with why not do it together and pool resources rather than duplicate and all look at the same thing um, it looks at things like the interaction between policy objectives. So I was talking earlier about the interaction between competition and resilience, but you know, we're also looking at the interaction between competition and privacy, and we published a joint statement on that earlier in the year, but also things like the interaction between competition and uh, online harms and content, given that's very topical in the UK at the moment as well. And lastly, it looks at things like skills and capabilities. You know, we're all building uh, you know, new functions to address these challenges. We need people, we need skilled people. How can we work together to bring those uh, bring those people in? So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't by any means say it's perfect. Um, it could certainly be improved and we're working hard on it. But I think the forum itself um, has certainly, from our perspective, been a very welcome and productive initiative. Um, and I hope it's the start of, you know, much closer working across a range of matters. Um, but very interested to learn in the approaches other people have, but also any thoughts others have on what we could be doing better. Thank you. Any other thought on this uh, on this question? Yeah, if I may yeah, add. Let me... uh, so okay. Elsie, let's start with Elsie and then Tobias, and then we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll come okay. to a close. Okay, excellent. So I I believe firmly in the idea of uh, of uh, cooperation among regulators. Uh, I like what Tobias referred to as the coalition. Um, I think it's necessary because as, as uh, Christina said, there are often uh, what may appear to be competing policy objectives. I don't think they're competing at all, but um, without this cooperation mechanism well laid out and working well, every regulator is going to see things from their silos. And uh, in the end, we don't get the overall um, benefits of, of regulation. Uh, and so however this is done, I think the important thing is that it's done. Um, I like the idea of what the UK does. In Ghana, we have a payment services, uh, payment systems and services advisory council that is made up of the central bank, is made up of the communications uh, ministry that regulates the telcos. Um, it's made up of even the Ministry of Finance is there. Uh, some industry groupings as well, like the Bankers Association, the FinTechs um, Trade Association and all of that. So it's really like a, a stakeholder grouping um, that sort of comes together to think through uh, the resilience of the payment system, uh, as well as the financial stability issues uh, in a comprehensive way. And then we have a Financial Stability Council uh, that is made up of all the financial sector regulators, including the central bank and the Ministry of Finance. We don't have the telcos regulator there, for example. We don't have the trade associations there. But at least um, across the financial system, uh, we're able to have conversations amongst each other as regulators in terms of risks to financial stability. And so, uh, you know, issues relating to operational risk um, and, and basically, you know, the interaction between finance and technology and, and all of what is going on in that field come to the fore. Um, and each of the regulators then finds the tools they have within their toolkits to be able to address emerging risks. So these are a start. And I think uh, ideally the, the idea would be to work a little bit more closer with other regulators like the Data Protection Commission and others to really find solutions to the problems that uh, we face as an emerging market uh, with a lot of fintech and, and tech activity um, with real benefits for us. So basically how, how we work towards um, mitigating the risks that are attendant um, to all of the benefits that we're, we're seeing in our market. Thank you. Thank you, Elsie and uh, Tobias, you will have the last word. Yeah, just uh, complementing uh, this very rich discussion um, is, this um, question about entity versus activities-based regulation. And uh, my sense is that uh, the two have to work together. Uh, in many countries, uh, it really wouldn't be possible, uh, in many countries, it wouldn't be possible to have entity-based regulation. This is something that the home country 
of the big tech would have to put into place. And of course, that's only uh, that's only in place in a very small number of countries at the moment that you have a sort of like consolidated regulatory approach uh, for for big tech firms. Uh, so for the time being, uh, in most countries, activities-based regulation uh, is the only uh, approach. Uh, so for example, there could be regulation on data or uh, regulation on bundling, regulation on competition. Uh, but ultimately, uh, that would have to be complemented also by uh, a more entity-based approach, uh, at least in the home country. Thank you very much, uh, Tobias. Uh, unfortunately, we have to, uh, to move on to the next session. Uh, I would like to thank all speakers very much. Uh, this has provided a lot of uh, experiences and, uh, and very thoughtful remarks that we can uh, uh, build on for the next sessions uh, and um, talking of the next session uh, it will be about the uh, experience in India with our uh, big tech fintech and banks in payments uh, you don't have to uh, reconnect so we'll make a short uh, pause and uh, please stay tuned thank you very much